Good afternoon, everyone. If everyone could kindly take their seats, please. Their seats in the front. Okay. Well, they've already taken the stage, and I'd like to introduce our panel for the afternoon. It's complicated, the curator-patron relationship, uh, moderated by Al Miner from MFA Boston, and I'll hand it over to him. Good afternoon, everybody. I hope you had a great lunch. You're feeling rejuvenated, refreshed, and ready to talk about something that you may already talk about a lot when you're uh, at home at your own museum, and that's the importance of building strong relationships with individual supporters. It doesn't matter if you work for a large encyclopedic institution like this one, or perhaps a small museum with a tight focus. We all spend a lot more time than I think we expected to as curators cultivating relationships with individuals. And we're all aware that the support coming from individuals is increasingly important in keeping our museums open and moving forward for, you know, hopefully generations beyond our tenures there. The thing that curators, I think, have to understand at first, at the beginning of our conversation, that we all know it at our hearts, is that we offer our patrons a lot as institutions, but they really crave time with us. They want FaceTime, they want one-on-one -on -one experiences with curators. Of course, they're interested in art, they're probably interested in your city and in civic responsibility more generally, but they want time with you. And as that happens, as conversations take place, you do build a relationship. And like any relationship in your life, there will be highs and lows. Things will change lows, 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 um, <laughs> things will change and you know, and you have to adjust as that patron's needs may be adjusting where they are in their stage of life or in the donor cycle and what your museum needs at any given time. You know, I think sometimes I have relationships with patrons that feel almost like they're my boss. Sometimes they feel like a client, so there's a different kind of trying to please them. There are moments when they become a true, genuine friend who you trust inside and outside the institution. I have patrons who are almost channeling my mother. Um, they care about what I eat, if I'm sleeping or not, my romantic relationships, they're very engaged. Um, <laughs> but you know, <laughs> through all of this, the bottom line is they want and we want to make our institutions better places and healthier. So how do we make our relationships with these people count so that we have the strength together and that strength then helps the museum more generally. I've got a great panel for you today and we're gonna hear some different opinions and perspectives to help strengthen our relationships. You know, goals today are to have an insightful and engaging conversation, but I really want everyone to walk out of this room at the end with true take-home tips that will work for you. Practical guidelines, etiquette, suggestions, what happens when the ethics get weird, these are things we want you to feel empowered about when you go home at the end of this conference. Here's how it's gonna work. Maria Robinson Glover, who is the head of development at the Southern California Institute of Architecture, and Paul Ha, the director of MIT's List Visual Arts Center, will give you a brief talk um, very casually about their role in all this from the development office or the director's chair. And then we'll have two more in-depth case studies from Cody Hartley, the director of curatorial affairs at the Georgia O'Keeffe Museum, and Renee Barrio from the McNay Art Museum. He's the chief curator there. So I'm gonna turn it to Maria, and at the end, our goal is to have a very significant time for Q&A. So our goal is to maybe leave 45 minutes even for true discussion as a large group. But Maria, take it away. Um, th can you hear me? Yes, you can. Thank you, Al, for inviting me to sit on this panel with all of you. I'm sort of like the odd woman out here. I don't have a curatorial background, but I have been raising money and working in development offices in the arts institutions uh, in Los Angeles, specifically in higher ed and a couple of museums as well. So in, in thinking a little bit about um, the topic of discussion, the, the complexities in terms of like relating to our donors, just speaking from the development standpoint, within development departments alone, it can get very complicated in and of itself because it's very territorial. A lot of times, don't, uh, development officers are really tagged with engaging individuals in the sense of trying to get high net worth gifts into the institution, and oftentimes they're competing with each other to make sure that they're the person who brings the money in. Um, so within uh, development offices itself, it can be territorial. But then when you take that same kind of idea and make it applicable to working with curators, sometimes that can also um, happen again. And, and a lot of times maybe curators might even feel that development may be infringing upon the hard work that they've uh, 
done over the years to cultivate a donor to the programs that they're working on. So there too you, uh, lies a complexity as well in terms of like engaging a donor. I think one of the things get, that gets lost in this is the fact that truly the relationship, the main relationship that we should always be focused on is the relationship that the donor has with the institution. Because at the end of the day, uh, if a curator leaves an institution, if a gift has come through, that gift still stays with the institution even after the curator leaves. And likewise, if a development officer leaves the institution, there's still some type of fiduciary responsibility with the donor and the institution. So when you look at these two sort of areas of the curator relationship and the development relationship with the donor, um, how do you come together to kind of figure out a way to keep that donor, again, engaged with the institution? And I think once both sides figure out that this is what it is, um, a lot of synergies uh, and opportunities begin to open up. I think uh, clearly the most uh, important relationship that a donor will have to an institution is rightfully so uh, quite often with the curator. When they see a development officer coming, like clearly they don't want to see me because they know, <laughs> <laughs> they know that I'm going to be asking for money. But they do, what they do want to, to, how they do want to engage is to talk to curators because you all are, so to speak, the rock stars of the institutions. And so they want to be with you. They want to have conversations with you. Um, but at some point, Th there may be a time where a donor feels, well, I think I've done everything that I possibly can do for this institution, and they may want to go elsewhere. So I think that's where one of the sort of opportunities for curators to engage with development officers presents itself. I've spoken to a few of you um, <coughs> since arriving, and I know some of the things that I've been asked that I think a lot of you are very interested in is how um, to deal with this whole idea of donor burnout. What happens? How do you uh, continue to uh, maintain a relationship with a, with a donor? Also, uh, thinking of ways to um, prospect a little bit more. Where can you find other donors to replace this big uh, donor that you have the potential of losing to another institution nearby? And so I'm more than happy to kind of like delve off and answer some of those questions in, in ways that we can work together as development officers with the curatorial group. Thank you for inviting me here. Um, I have a disclaimer to start with. Um, I think I've been invited to provide the director's point of view of, of this relationship, and um, I'm just going to say it's this one person that I'm representing and not anyone else in my field. And I think I've been asked because I've ran um, four distinct organizations, um, four organizations with four financial setup. Uh, one was um, an encyclopedic collecting institution with um, healthy endowment. Uh, tied to a university, that was Yale University. I worked in a small alternative not-for-profit um, with no endowment whatsoever, and we had to raise our money for that entire year every year. Um, and I also worked for a um, non-collecting brand new museum for a city in St. Louis, and then um, provided them with their um, newly created endowment. And then I currently work at a university art gallery, which is uh, collecting, commissioning, um, and exhibiting, uh, that, but also has a modest endowment. And I've also worked on three capital can campaigns. Uh, two of them, I ran them, uh, ranging from $35 million to $125 million. So um, I think um, what's so great about this group is you bring such vast knowledge of, of working with donors, collecting, connoisseurship, running institutions, that I think for this panel to work properly and to be at its best, I think there has to be an active passing of the microphone and you guys asking lots of questions and you guys answering lots of questions, uh, providing um, from direct experience and um, I'm sure you have many case studies you can provide. And I think what's so valuable about this particular group is that um, you guys all are in your trenches working hard, and, and many times you don't really have people you can talk to. You, sometimes you can't talk to your director, although this director is always available. And then um, <laughs> you can't talk to donors, and you can't talk to your, um, you know, your coworkers. So I think this ca can provide a forum where you, we can you know, openly discuss your problems and ideas and ask for genuine help. And, I guarantee there's ex specific examples out there uh, where people can actually provide the answer. So 
I'm hoping that it's not just the last 45 minutes, but if, you, if there's something burning at you, just shout it out, and then I'm sure someone in this room will be able to answer that. It is a pleasure to be here this afternoon in Houston. Thank you, Al, for inviting all of us to this topic. It's one of my favorites. Um, it, it really is. I'm not kidding. I, I don't say that at, at all facetiously. Um, a little background on my career. I started as an American art curator. Uh, I was trained at UC Santa Barbara. I went to the Clark from there and then to the MFA Boston, where I had outstanding colleagues. Um, I was there for the installation of the Art of the Americas Wing, which opened in 2010 after which I thought, great, now I can settle down into being a normal curator. I can work on, on collection publications, I can build the collection, I can do exhibitions, no more installing a major wing. That's when the director called and said, you know there's no future for you in that department. Okay, uh, what he meant was there was not an obvious path for, for advancement for me in that department. Um, my colleagues were, were cruising along and not going anywhere, which was great. And he said, I want you to take a chance, move up to the development department. And literally it was up, it was upstairs, curators in the basement, development had the lovely corner offices with windows looking out over Fenway Park. Um, so that alone was reason enough to take the job. Um, but I really hesitated because I felt like I was giving up everything I had prepared for and trained for as a curator and, and a scholar to move into the dark arts of advancement. Um, when I made the leap, it was such a revelation, and I enjoyed it immensely. It was a position called Director of Gifts of Art, which is exactly what it sounds like. Uh, I worked with curators throughout the entire institution, all the departments, all of our patrons that were giving works of art to the collection to coordinate that entire process. And we brought amazing things into the collection. I think it's one of the smartest things institutions can do if they want to build their collection and they have the resources to put curatorial and advancement in close communication. Not only were we building the collection through gifts of art and fund for art acquisition, we were building those relationships and we really found that nothing brought donors closer to the institution, made them feel more like part of the family than a gift of art. It was such a lasting legacy that it really stitched them in to the organization. In moving to development, I learned a few key things that I'll start with. Curators are not the only staff that care about the institution. I think it was easy to assume that, that, it is still easy to assume that we are the heart and soul of these institutions and we're the only ones that really truly care. That was not what I found. I found amazing partners in advancement who deeply cared about the organization, worked incredibly hard to ensure that it's, it succeeded. Um, they were smart, professional colleagues dedicated to advancing the entire organization. That said, you're exactly right. The donors didn't want to talk to the advancement staff. They wanted the curator to come visit. Uh, and it was, it was very clear that, that being able to travel together, a curator and a, and a development officer, was a powerful combination. Uh, I learned a lot, and I hope you'll share some of this, about kind of the, the smart strategic management of donors, prospect and relationship management, going through a cycle of identification, of cultivation, of making the ask, of stewardship, carefully managing these relationships. It is not accidental. Uh, and it, when it's done right, the results are amazing. It's about matching people with means and, and, and kind of the desire, the inclination to support the organization with projects they care about. It's not cold calls. It's not difficult, awkward conversations. It's sharing your excitement and enthusiasm with someone that has the resources to make it happen. Curators can be invaluable partners in that. They can also be liabilities. Uh, and I, I you don't have to point fingers, but um, there, w there was a phrase that we would use, donor ready or not donor ready. Um, and uh, it was really was about <laughs> a degree of comfort and a degree of, um, boy, I should choose my words carefully in this audience, um, <laughs> the ability to put someone in a room with a donor or send them into their home and know that they would be appropriate that they would understand that kind of fine dance between being an expert and being respectful of the collector's expertise and finding a way to walk that line of engaging and connecting with someone without insulting them. Um, I think for me, ultimately, it was being active in the kind of um, shaping and support of the organization that I found incredibly empowering. And what I took away from it ultimately was that if curators want to continue 
to be the heart and soul of their organizations. They, we all have got to become outstanding development officers. Um, we need to choose our own destiny and become part of the process of finding the resources to make our organizations grow and thrive. The skills that, that became obviously um, essential, diplomacy, empathy, patience, persistence, um, I think a certain knack for handling people that might be classified as difficult. Um, and I think we've all agreed that we're going to try to leave names out whenever possible. <laughs> I've heard rumors that this is being live tweeted, so um, <laughs> to protect the, the guilty, we'll try to leave names off. But some people are difficult. We work in many cases with incredibly successful, powerful people um, who are used to getting their way. And often there's a, any number of disadvantages, whether that's wealth, experience, education, whatever it is, um, there's often an inequity, and that um, makes for challenging situations. But if you have the skills to be able to manage those relationships, um, it's incredibly important. They may be crazy, but they often hold the keys to, to your success and your organization's success. Um, there's a part of it that I, I really can't describe as anything better than sales. Um, and I mean that not in the, in the worst way it might be imagined, but it's the sense of knowing when to keep pushing, knowing when to, to back off and, and, and let things settle for a little while, um, and consensus building, um, being an advocate for your organization, for your projects. Um, I will try to quickly summarize one kind of case study of one of the most amazing um, projects and gifts I worked on while I was at the MFA. I'm now at the George O'Keefe Museum uh, in Santa Fe, New Mexico, which uh, is a very different um, brief, but I work very closely with our, all of our patrons, and, and part of the reason uh, I was recruited for that position certainly was the experience I had with development. Um, they needed someone who could not only manage the curatorial department, but was also very happy to go out and um, raise funds, and that's been a, a, a boost um, for me, certainly. I want to talk a bit about um, the Robert Owen Lehman collection of Benning bronzes at the MFA. This was a gift made in 2012. It's one of the, the first projects I started working on when I took the job, and it was barely finished when I left. <laughs> um, it took, took a few, a year and a half or so to, to push this along, um, and it reveals a lot of the most complicated uh, situations, I think, that could emerge when working with donors and working with sensitive materials. Uh, it was about the fall of 2011, Malcolm Rogers got a call uh, from an individual who said, I have a large collection of Benning bronzes, are you interested? At the same time, this individual was calling three or four other museums in the country. Malcolm, and there's a lesson in this one, Malcolm is the only one who called this, this donor back, um, at least immediately. Others called a week or two later. Malcolm was on the phone immediately. I think he was on a plane within the week to go see this collector and say, we are certainly interested. Um, once Malcolm had decided this was of interest, he, he kind of put me into it. Then my role was to coordinate the efforts of our curatorial staff, our provenance researcher, our conservation staff, to assess the potential gift, uh, and then begin the, the, the long series of negotiations that required to actually finalize the gift and the gift agreement. Um, these are very sensitive objects. Um, there's, um, they're largely because of their, their history of origin. Um, they are incredibly well known, I would say notorious. They all left the Kingdom of Benin in 1897 during a very um, aggressive, unpleasant, punitive raid. The kingdom was destroyed, these objects were removed by force, um, the royal family was, was sent in to, to um, um, the word escapes me, exile, thank you, um, sent into exile. It was just a, a kind of horrible uh, example of colonial powers run amok. Um, so these, these are carded with, with uh, or freighted with um, difficult associations. So we immediately had reservations. You might imagine that our curator of African art, our curator of provenance, thought about these objects very differently than the collector of these objects who'd started collecting them in the 60s. He did not want to talk about provenance. He could care less what the nation of Nigeria claimed or didn't claim about their right to these objects. Um, as far as he was concerned, he bought them fair and square on the open market, end of story, do you want them or not? Um, so negotiating between kind of one per set of perspectives, his, and the, the very well-founded, well-researched, professional opinions and advice of our staff was part of the challenge. Um, but at the same time, these are one of the testaments um, to the great 
human um, history of creativity. There's some of the finest objects made anywhere on the planet at any time. Um, the group of objects, 34 some things, ranges from the late 15th to the 19th century. Uh, they have been compared to the baptistry doors in Florence. They're just incredible objects of, of human um, creativity and beauty. So there was an argument for really kind of pulling these off the private market um, and securing them for, for the greater public. All these arguments that we've heard hashed out for many years now were playing out among our staff and colleagues. Um, relationship management became critical. Uh, the donor had very, very strong opinions. Um, Robert Owen Lehman is the last of the Lehman Brothers family. Um, he's the first to, si to decide that I'm not going into the banking business, I'm going to art school instead. Um, but he had the resources, of course, to collect magnificent objects and, and built this group of things. Um, there were uh, any number of complications that could have kind of scuttled the project along the way. Uh, he insisted that the objects be given a gallery, uh, and that's this, this beautiful space you're seeing. This is a, in the original part of the MFA's building, a remodeled space with brand new casework and mounts all top of the line, high end, not a cheap space to remodel. He insisted we have a gallery, he was not gonna pay for it. Uh, so we had to find the money to renovate the galleries um, in a way that was satisfactory to him. Um, so fundraising from other sources, trying to figure out how exactly we were going to uh, cover the cost of this gallery was another piece of the challenge. Um, <laughs> The personalities, I, I think it's worth just talking about, you know, these are all very human relationships. They are complicated. There was a great moment where he was screaming at me on the phone because I had done something wrong. And I thought, this is it, I'm gonna go tell Malcolm I quit, I've lost my job, I understand, I'll resign. Uh, so Malcolm and I got on the phone with, with the donor uh, and he railed again for another half hour and then said, I'm sorry, I, I have, you know, I'm getting blood work done and I haven't had any food, my, my blood sugar's low, I'm just grumpy, I'm like, oh, Please, you cannot call me with low, low blood sugar. That is not <laughs> fair. <laughs> but, you know, he's human. They're, these are human, human relationships. Um, internal advocacy became a big part of it, too. Working through the different channels inside the, net, inside the institution to make sure that we were all on board, that we believed this was the right thing to do for the organization um, was enormous. I could go on quite a bit about the, the final, the kind of fine details of the gift, um, but I think I just want to kind of lay this out there as one of those situations um, where you have amazing opportunities and amazing objects, but they are, it's so fraught with challenges that at any given moment you might think, I, let's just walk away, it's too hard. But in the end, when the objects were on view, when the, the granddaughter of the last sitting Oba, the last sitting king of the Kingdom of Benin, is there in your galleries celebrating these as, as the testament to her people who now live in the diaspora, as a testament to their great kingdom and great society, suddenly things became all worth it. So it's, it's worth it, but it is hard work getting there. Hello, um, I'm Renee Barrio. So I'm both the chief curator and the contemporary art curator at the McNay in San Antonio. And I was asked to do a case study for this panel. And so what I wanna do is to sort of trace how uh, uh, the expansion of the museum, the physical expansion with the new building also propelled the expansion of our contemporary art program. Um, and that was something that was unanticipated. And uh, as a result, we had sort of unprecedented growth in our collection, in our exhibitions program, in our support. So this has been a very positive experience. I would say 90% very positive, very few horror stories that have come out of this, which I'm very appreciative of. But it was also a lot of uh, donor cultivation, stewardship, stewardship and, and a lot of really close contact with supporters. Uh, but in the end, over the years, we've been able to transform uh, our sort of supporters who support with enthusiasm into supporters who support with gifts of art and gifts of money. So uh, we're gonna start, I thought I would start because many of you probably are not familiar with the McNay, just a little bit of history and also gives some context for how uh, the kind of contemporary art program evolved. So uh, we are, situated right in a residential neighborhood in San Antonio. And we were founded by Marion McNay, who, was, who had a family inheritance, and in the late 1920s built a Spanish colonial revival mansion on a site that was 23 acres. And that, forms the, that formed the core of what's now the museum. Um, Marion McNay was uh, very interested in collecting, and so she began to collect 
in the late 20s, and she collected for the last, next 20-something years to her death in 1950. And she was interested in particular in modern art and in European modernism, so she, was collect she formed a collection of, some, of stellar examples by Gauguin, Picasso, Matisse, Dufy, uh, real, uh, real gems for the time she was collecting, and she was collecting at the right time. She also formed a collection of American works on paper and some Southwest objects. So when she died in 1950, her will left the home, the 23-acre site, and her collection to form a museum. So we opened our doors only four years later in 1954, and we have the distinction of being the first museum of modern art in Texas. So in the late 1990s, our board of trustees uh, set four priorities uh, to move the institution forward. Uh, let me mention two other things. In our whole 62, three year history, we've had only two directors. So our first director served from 1954 to 1991, and then our current director came in 1991. So it's a very unusual situation. <laughs> and also for a bit of context, our operating budget is about uh, between eight and nine million dollars currently. So in, 19, in the late 1990s, the board uh, set these four priorities. One was to renovate the museum's aging um, environmental systems. The second was to, uh, to um, not renovate, but really um, to preserve the, the original how home, the, the ambiance of the original home, and restore that. The third was to create a space for changing exhibitions, because we really did not have a, a dedicated space for temporary and changing exhibitions. And then the fourth, to was, the fourth was to um, increase our endowment for supporting a larger institution that we're gonna grow into. So in 2008, the Steering Center for Exhibitions opened. So here I have a view of the original home on the left and then the new Steering Center, which opened in 2008 on the right. So the, currently the original home is now uh, used to show our collection and exhibitions from the collection, and then major changing exhibitions are shown in the Steering Center, and we do a rotation of about three presentations a year. Just to sort of as a side note, the new uh, Steering Center was designed by Jean-Paul Viguier, who is an architect based in Paris, and I think today it is still the only museum he's done in the United States. Uh, the capital campaign for this, this entire four uh, priority um, strategy was just over 50 million. 33 million was, um, came from our board. So our board, um, our board contributed almost 60% of the entire amount, which included a bequest from Arthur Steeren, for, for whom the building is named. This next slide shows how, sort of how we've grown over the years. So uh, if you look back to 1954, at the very top, and then you look down to 2008 at the very bottom, you can see that the new Stern Center doubled the size of the museum. So really we went from being, uh, from being a, sort of a, a medium or modest size, modest scaled institution to being a much more significantly scaled institution. So we had in that capital campaign, um, it provided great opportunity for, for developing relationships with existing donors, but also to cultivate new donors, to cultivate new uh, sources of income, and also to cultivate a sort of new energy to, around the institution. Um, and that really create a kind of a, a, a whole new kind of general energy around the McNay in, in, in general. Uh, it also created great naming opportunities. So here I just put this slide in. You can see the, the name on the, the naming of the building, the Jane and Arthur Steering Center for Exhibitions. Um, and then we have obviously, with like any other building project, we have naming opportunities throughout the, throughout the um, galleries. So early on in our programming, we made a decision that we should open the uh, museum space, the exhibition space, with a presentation of our post-war and contemporary art collection. So just as a sort of a note about our collection, the McNay entered the contemporary art arena very late. Um, so we, we realized we were not going to create an encyclopedic collection of contemporary art. We were going to make a collection that builds on strengths in our existing modern collection. And it also reflects some of the kind of collecting ambitions of our, of our founder, who was really interested in sort of often atypical or eccentric examples by well-known artists. So we were looking at both kind of uh, unusual examples by 
sort of well-known artists, or we are looking at works by artists that are maybe a little lesser known or that need to be, they're sort of in line for rediscovery. So this exhibition, American Art Since 1945, was the first time we were really able to present the kind of range and breadth of our contemporary collection. Um, several works had never been seen because we never had the galleries in which to show them. And then we had also been acquiring works that were sort of holding back in anticipation of this opening exhibition. And this is really what, what we saw was this immediate response to contemporary art that we had no idea would happen. So there was this immediate audience for contemporary art. And there had been sort of a, a fledgling contemporary art support group that suddenly became very active and interested and really galvanized around the, the collection with, with this first presentation. So our, collect, our, our support group uh, began to sort of actively make acquisitions and does continues to do that. I just, I just have two examples here of acquisitions made by our support group that, that are guided through the curatorial process. Um, and this pro program has really uh, created like uh, amazing ownership in the collection, in the contemporary program, and in the institution, not only by the support group, but by the community as a whole, because there's a lot of uh, anticipation of what the group will buy. There's a, a, a great sort of rallying around the acquisitions, it's, and, and also it's really, as I said, it gives the members of the group real ownership so when they bring other members, other friends, other patrons into the galleries, they can point out works that they had a hand in buying. In addition, what we also found was um, this amazing sort of outpouring of gifts of works of art uh, from d donors that we already knew and then we also uh, started to establish contact with new donors that we had not had before, uh, with, with, with dealers, with artists, and we started to receive both gifts of art and gifts, financial gifts to support our collection. Um, so I just give two examples here. The George McNeil um, painting on the left from the estate of the artists, and then Sandy Scoglin's installation on the right, which was a gift to the artists to the museum, it, which was accompanied, the installation accompanied by a photograph. So all of a sudden, we were starting to see, as a result, of, really as a result of the new building, as a result of this first exhibition, uh, this sort of outpouring of gifts to really enhance our collection. We also started to see uh, this really heightened interest in our exhibition program. So our, our exhibitions of major contemporary um, presentations was really enhanced. And I would say we do three major, major presentations in this space every year, uh, and probably Two, usually two of the three are some are of contemporary or at least modern nature. So here I just put two examples. One, the recent Made in Germany, which was drawn from the collection, the Rubel collection. And the other, Andy Warhol, Fame and Misfortune, which, came, which was drawn from the collection of the Warhol Museum, both projects organized by the museum. We found that over the years, we were able to convert some of these donors of works of art or donations to the, to the acquisitions fund into supporters for exhibition. So in both cases, we had host committees that were chaired by some of our, our, our contemporary art support members, and also uh, support direct financial support was given for exhibitions from some members of our group. So in addition to these sort of kind of more um, high profile sort of exhibitions, we also were able to develop an, uh, an audience for sort of more offbeat or maybe more original or more challenging projects. Uh, here we have two original exhibitions that we organized on the left, uh, New Image Sculpture, and on the right, Beauty Rain, uh, which was a painting survey that looked at the kind of Baroque in contemporary painting. And I just wanted to say, this is a slide of, of um, showing some of our, our contemporary art group members. Uh, for me, one of, I found one of the best techniques I've had for developing this support with travel, and I know that uh, I probably hear a lot of groaning in the audience when we hear about sort of museum travel, but in the last 10 years, our group has organized over 30 trips, anything from one to four days, but I've had incredible bonding experiences with all of the members of that group, and it's really that time where I can get close to people, talk to people, get them excited about new ideas, get them to commit to fund exhibitions on the spot in a bar, so it's really, <laughs> It's really become, for me, like one of the best ways that we can, we can create support and enthusiasm, and also for me to really engage um, our audience. Okay, thank you.
So I'm gonna put a slide up just in the background as we start our conversation. Um, some of you may be familiar with this list already, but several years ago, Leonard Lauder, the well-known collector, patron, supporter of quite a few institutions, some more so than others, um, visited the MFA Boston and spoke to the staff about what he and others like him expect or want from their relationships with curators. What behavior is key and ideal to making that relationship great? How, once you make the initial contact, do you keep the relationship going? How do you acknowledge the relationship? So these are really an insider's tips for how to deal with people like him. Now, just because you behave well does not mean you're going to get a windfall at the end, but I think we all know that if you behave badly, it probably won't work out. Um, so I just want to leave that on in the background as we have a wider discussion, both down here on the stage and up in the audience, about specific issues, whether you want to share um, a specific situation with a donor who will remain lameless and, um, you know, and what happened, or if you have a question clearly for the audience and for the panelists, we'd love to hear that too. I have a huge list of questions, but I will only resort to it if necessary. Um, does anyone have a question already for the panel to get us started? Excellent, right here in the front. Is there a mic? While the microphone makes its way down, can I just check my assumptions? Um, quick show of hands, how, for how many of you is working with or collectors, working with donors, working with advancement a, a core part of your job? Okay, just wanna make sure. So they're not just here because they were bored. It. Yeah, okay, that's good. I am uh, John Lukovic from the Denver Art Museum. Um, I was recently at a uh, fundraiser at the museum and having a conversation about, uh, well, with someone who was sitting next to me, it was the first time to the museum, and we were talking a lot about uh, old money and new money. Specifically, um, he was in the tech sector. It was his first time to the museum, and we were talking about how many of the main funders to our institution were old money. They were people who had a long, you know, generations and generations of family in the local community, and that money gave locally. However, in the tech sector, I mean, Denver is now kind of a booming metropolis. There, you know, there's a lot of new Fortune 500 companies that have moved into the area, um, and people who have made their fortunes rather than inherited their fortunes. In this world, in today's world, is very globalized. People are looking broadly. They're looking at world issues, you know, um, hunger or um, you know. AIDS or malaria issues in other parts of the world, or you know, health health types of uh, issues, you know, that are very very broad. Um, but there's the the conversation went into the into the realm of people who are in the tech sector who made their money are looking globally. They're not investing locally, and they're not necessarily making a commitment locally to you know keeping their business in that particular location or um, and but. It's just, it's a new frame of mind. No one, some of these people have just never considered some of these. And as the area in Denver, around Denver is growing, you know, we are realizing, you know, talking to our development officer, it's hard to make contact with many of these new potential donors and to bring them in. So I guess my question is, how do you um, change the approach that has worked so well with old money and start attracting new money? I think one thing you have to look at is really to try to look at locally first, because those are the people who are going to be um, closer to your institution rather than outside. But if you're thinking specifically of tapping into that particular industry, I would say to look at those individuals who are already interested in what you're producing. Um, they'll, they'll be more likely to come to your institution if they're already <coughs> farther away. Um, it, this is also making me think a little bit about um, data mining and, and prospecting as well. It, it sounds like that's where, where you're headed. Um, if, if you're at an institution where you're fortunate enough to have a development department that has a prospect researcher, I would suggest to you to make friends with that person and make that person just your ally in a lot of the work that you do because they are trained to look for these things. They look at databases and they can look at numbers and figure out who 
in your database would be uh, most likely to give to your institution. And it's another way of kind of like looking for people who haven't been giving broadly, but who are already interested in your institution. But I think first and foremost, you should probably look more closer to people who are already tied to your institution locally. And then also look at people, again, if they are outside, look at people who are already interested in the, the subject matter. I have a follow-up question, but you should all answer. Well, but will I forget it? <laughs> My follow-up question? All right, ask me again at the end. And I'll write, write it down. Write it down. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just, I don't, I have an answer. I just want to actually add to the challenge. So in, in our case, we have benefited from very strong individual support, very from individuals and families in this, in the area who have been strong supporters. and. We're now at that point, like everybody else, generational shifts, their children are not interested in what we do. So, but we've been, you know, in, in 60 years, we've been pretty spoiled with a certain group of donors. So we're now at the crossroads of looking where, where do we go to get broaden that base of support. And I don't think you change your tactics. I think what worked in the past is also pertinent right now. And unless they have many different global headquarters, they want, what, what everyone wants is this community. So whether they're, they're hiring a, a top-level CEO or someone, it's their first job in their company, what they want locally, they want good schools, they want parks, they want, you know, they want cultural amenities like symphonies, ballet, museums, and you're part of that ecosystem. And so it's about explaining to them that what you're doing is building a community, and it's not just about you, but it's having a larger ecosystem of what's available to, to who wants to live there. I, I would just add, I think, to me, this is a specific example of a broader question a lot of us are facing. How do we get younger audiences? How do we get younger donors? Um, and, I've, you know, and, and I remember being in Boston, we felt like there's this huge pocket of wealth in the, the, uh, the pharmaceutical industry and the tech industry that was on the western edge of the city. And in the development department, we just felt like we have, we have no penetration. We don't know how to reach these people. Um, one of the strategies that we were just starting, and we can follow up and see how well it's worked, was to find advocates, to find one person, one well-placed CEO, CEO in one of those companies that gets art, cares about art, and make them your, your personal advocate, friend. Invite your friends into the museum. I will help work with you to help ex understand why this is an important thing for this community and why you and your colleagues should be supporting it. Um, so I think you, you don't change your tactic, tactics, but you might change your message so you are communicating relevance. And I think that's true for any audience you try to reach. But I would, again, turn this around to the audience. Are you doing things? Are, have you seen your peers doing things that are working at getting, kind of cracking into those sectors that seemed un inaccessible previously? MIT just launched a $5 billion campaign last week. And uh, I'm, I'm sorry, the B? Yeah. And uh, they think big. And arts is definitely part of that campaign. And they're saying, they're, they're pulling us in to meet with the big donors who are not collectors, who don't support museums. But they're saying, we're part of a larger ecosystem at MIT where it's about creativity, it's about thinking creatively. And um, they, they pull us out often. And, and, and in a way, we're helping this, this tech sector. So I think there's something you can learn from that as well. So my follow-up question was, all right, so we're targeting a new generation, potentially, of patrons and donors. Did they want something different from the one-on-one -on -one time with the curators than the older generation did? So for instance, I feel like I have a special affinity for Jewish women over 65, and it's a well-known <laughs> thing. Um, and a lot of my time with I'm this demographic it. is um, we eat, we do a lot of eating. Um, <laughs> But you know, it's like, let's get together and have tea or have coffee or can I have lunch with you? That is not maybe what a 35-year-old who just invented some stupid app that made them really rich <laughs> wants. Do you know, and, and, and Prospect Research is maybe an end to this answer, is do we know what experiences these people might want with a curator as opposed to, do they still want a traditional tour of the exhibition you organized? Do they want to have lunch with you? Or are they looking for a different type of connection, a one, and like a personal connection to the curators of the institution? I, I think it could be all of those things. And again, it speaks to the, the fact that you need to know your donor as much as you possibly can know about them before you first meet with them. You could do a lot of Googling. I mean, we have information available 
to us in so many different ways. And, and it, the arts community, too, is, is a very small community. So I think it's really easy to kind of like find somebody who knows this person who might be able to share details with you. Um, in terms of like engaging an older audience and a younger audience, I, I do think they want different things. I mean, ultimately, they do want to make a difference, but in different ways. I think um, what I've found is that people who are of the older generation, they give because they're asked to give, and they have this culture of giving. And when they see that you need something, there's there are really no ties attached to it. They may want to have their name put on something, of course, but um, the younger people, I find, they really just want to see what you're going to do with their money. And a lot of times, naming opportunities aren't important to them. I think for them, what's most important is that the money that they give you, something happens with it. You know, and, and some, something is uh, moving somebody else or makes an impact in their lives personally. So again, it speaks a lot to about knowing who your donor is and knowing exactly some of those interests that they might have and being able to put some of these ideas in and have a, a really full conversation about the things that interest them most because somewhere along the line they're going to tap into something and maybe something can be created for them there that's specific to your institution that another institution like yours may not be willing to offer. Knowing your donor I think is critical. Anything you can get, any bit of information you can use, and, you, and again if you do have a research team and your development department, they are incredibly valuable tools. But whatever you can find, I, I don't mean this to sound as sarcastic or cynical as it'll sound, but don't be afraid to pander, um, but pander sincerely. Uh, and I, I'm thinking of, you know, th there are interests I have developed now that I never thought would be interests. When I'm working with certain donors, I care deeply about how a sports team is doing because they happen to be partial owners of that sports team. And when the team is doing well, I do well. <laughs> if the team is losing, I'm not calling. <laughs> It's not a good day to call. I watch the market now in ways that have nothing to do with my retirement account. <laughs> I'm much more concerned about my donor's retirement accounts on some days. And I think just being aware that, you know, these, again, they're, they're human relationships and what motivates, what interests, what engages these folks, if you can connect with that, you've got something. And maybe with those new tech donors, if there's some way for you to match them up with a mentor, because in St. Louis, I think something like, 7% of the donors provided 90% of our funding annually. And the average age of who gave significantly was well over 75. And so, uh, and they were excited that we were activating the city. And so they love coming to the after party, seeing you know, all the young people. But if you can somehow connect those two to talk to each other and, and what it gave them at, to give, I think it would be a really nice pairing. Uh, a comment on the, the issue of you know how to capture the the new money uh, in any town in Birmingham. One of the things we deal with is what some people have called the the ancien pauvre, the ancient poor, who have an important family name. You know Worthington, Worthington the third, founding family of the museum. But they don't have two nickels left to rub together. They're tapped out. Uh, their 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 t time came and went. Yet, if you talk to certain trustees about, you know, who should fund this project, oh, have you talked to Worthington, Worthington the third? And uh, in fact, some of our trustees are not keeping abreast of who the new players are coming into town. And it's really, to be perfectly honest, it's cost us some opportunities. There was one uh, couple, a, a retired physician who had invested well, and his longtime partner that I kept you know, banging the drum trying to get us to, to put them on the advisory board or the board of trustees or the committee on collections. They said, we're going to lose them, we're going to lose them. Guess what? They founded their own museum in northern Georgia um, with a major, major gift. Fortunately, things have changed. They've come back to us, so not, all is not lost. But we finally, um, we enfranchised enfranchise them a, a bit too late to get that major cash gift. Uh, and so I think it's, it's important to yeah, do, your, do your prospecting. But one, the one thing I wanted to mention, one way we're thinking about how to enfranchise um, the emerging generation of, of donors and collectors is you know, we said for a while the last thing we need in Birmingham uh, is another uh, support group, collection support group. We need that like a hole in the head because we've already got, what, six collection support groups and, we've g and that covers about 700 patrons or so, I think all, all told, ebbing and flowing. We establish an emerging collectors group, which kind of serves as a, 
as a um, distribution center to kind of get people excited about the museum. We deliberately called it emerging collectors, not young collectors, because people can emerge at any age. And one thing we've discovered is people really like social opportunities, not just at the museum. In fact, often they want to be outside interfacing with other people their own age, and the membership is building itself because these people have kids that play soccer together, or, you know, it's, it's the, we're using their network to build our network. Another question, topic? There's someone up here on the left. Hi, so I have a question for um, those of us who are a bit uh, younger curators and whether or not, I get, and I guess this is a question for the, um, it's a two-part question. So one is, is for those, of you, for those of us who are kind of getting into those assistant associate curator positions, what sometimes, because you see the positions and, and they expect you to kind of have this donor kind of cultivation ability, but that doesn't necessarily mean when you're hired you actually have that ability or you're trained in that ability as you were kind of saying, you know, donor ready, not donor ready. And so when, when I guess is the expectation um, for us to either have relationships established, begin those relationships, have those conversations, because as people are kind of moving from institution, if you don't kind of get trained in that donor cultivation or presentation, how are you then expected into other institutions already have those abilities? So I'd be curious as to what other curators have to say about that. Well, it touches on one of my favorite topics that I've gotten into arguments over. Um, are good, are curators that can manage donors very successfully born or made? <laughs> Um, and I think they're made. I think it is a skill set you can develop and learn. I think, you know, being born with uh, an open personality and uh, a, a pleasant demeanor helps, um, but there's a skill set and a kind of a social comfort level that you can develop with practice. <laughs> um, I think back to the, my first few opening receptions when I was an assistant curator, I felt so completely out of place wandering around with these people that I knew every one of them thought I was, you know, um, in, in a, you know, undereducated, uh, underfunded. <laughs> uh, they just, you know, I just assumed all these things. It was my own, my own um, anxiety coming out. Um, with enough practice, it got to the point where now I'm like, I love cultivation. I love participating in this process and being in the middle of these conversations. Uh, and that's just become second nature, but it's been through, through practice and exposure. So I, I think institutions vary, and there's to some degree it depends on what your, uh, your, your superiors, whether that's the director of curatorial or the advanced advancement department or the director, what their comfort level is in terms of bringing you into the conversations. Um, but I, I guess I would advise, like, as soon as you see an opening to, to introduce yourself, to say hello, to welcome someone, just to be a friendly face, get in there um, and get, get used to um, having those really meaningful, engaging conversations and moving them from kind of, you know, um, an unknown to a known. It's on the job training, but I want to throw out a weird situation and see what you think. So when I started at the MFA Boston, a patron who I now genuinely consider a true, true friend said to me the first time I met her, I hope you know that I was very close to your predecessor. And I feel strongly that, and I am the only one who's honest enough to tell you this, that he shouldn't have left and he was forced out. And you sound really nice and really cool and it sounds like you've got a lot of experience, but I just want you to know that this is not gonna be easy. Um, <laughs> And I didn't have a lot of, ex honestly, I had very little experience with the patron issues. My previous museum was not private, was not 100% privately funded like the MFA Boston is. And I just didn't know what to do. And even looking back, I kind of don't know what I did. Um, <laughs> like, because now we're good. But do you have specific tips or recommendations for not only making first contact, but first contact with someone who may not want to be contacted or is not... It was like, I'm already attached to another curator at this institution and we're close, or I was attached to your predecessor, or I'm not really interested in your area of specialty. Is there, is there a good hook for that sort of first encounter, 
no, I'm just screwed, <laughs> right? But you know, no, I, I think there's a, there's a mix of sort of sort of organic and scheduled, right? And so, but to go back to your question, I, I think as a young curator, the most important thing you can do for yourself is to to learn that knowledge, know your craft, know your subject, because the connection you should actually be sort of guided by the director or the development people, and they'll pull you in when they need you, but you have to be ready. So when you're on the spot, because they're gonna pull you in because they're uncomfortable and they don't know the subject, and they're relying on you to step up and to shine. And so the best thing you could do is to be prepared to speak on any subject that you're working on charmingly. Great point. Also, <laughs> also as an assistant and associate curator, if there's a more senior curator you can shadow or or um, have you know requests to be sort of taken along on along the way. So yeah, let them know you're interested in those experiences. That that's something you want to pursue. And I actually I really like your question because you're thinking like a development officer. <laughs> <laughs> so Second career path. <laughs> and the thing is too is I I think um, really if you do have a development department, I'm assuming that you do, is to tap into them very quickly and let them know. This is what you want to do. You want to be able to engage um, donors in a really thoughtful and meaningful way. And uh, what I'm hearing too is that at some point you're going to have a portfolio of your own. Development officers have portfolios of people that they go out to and cultivate on, on so many different levels. And um, if you're there, if I was a development officer working with you, of course I would use you to, to advance my goal in raising money because you know the language, you know the talk, and you can give them the beautiful speech and the important uh, reasons why they should support your institution. And the way you would use me is that you would, you, you would ask me to give the legalities around a potential program or a gift in that sense. So I, there, there are partnerships there that can be developed, but you as a curator, you're already thinking like a development officer, and you could probably just make asks on your own, it sounds like, too. And also uh, sometimes you have to um, treat the development person as a donor, because they're looking for things to fund. And if you cultivate the development person, they're gonna, you're going to come up in their mind as they come meet a donor. Stephanie? Yeah, I was just going to say that, um, I, I mean, I think your question is a really good one. Um, and I think that being able to be in kind of partnership with the development officer is really important. And I think sometimes one of the easiest ways is if you've worked on an exhibition, you be the go-to person who can deliver an exquisite 30 minute, 20 minute, 12 minute, whatever time you're given by the development officer, don't give them the, the 90 minute tour with all the footnotes because most of those patrons are not interested. So if you can figure out and develop that skill, you will get called by development all the time because you're the, yep. you're the curator who can be, engage with donors. And if it's your show, if it's a colleague show, whatever it is, be available. I think that's important. But I, the other thing I kind of struck me is I think this conversation about curatorial and development reminds me of years ago conversations about education and curatorial. And it's like we've moved to a different silo. Um, I am struck that within institutions, I mean, I think what happened at MFA is, I think, happening in more institutions. And I think development departments are going to become a new um, career path for some curators. And the f fact of the matter is they're paid more. <laughs> and if you look at, you know, if, I mean, there's no way to really look, you know, I mean, directors can look at it, but if you look at kind of the, um, you know, what people are paid in different silos, um, a mid-level person in curatorial is not paid as much as a mid-level person in advancement. And that's the simple fact. And I, and I think that's a problem. Because we're all, we always say that curators are the kind of the core and the essence of the institution, but we're also, what are you valued at in terms of what you're paid? And I think that is, I think that's from a director's point of view, an administrative point of view, I think that's a fundamental core inequity. Um, but it is what it is. So I think that development and advancement, instead of being, you know, it used to be a kind of a we they kind of conversation and was somebody development ready? Could somebody be invited to a dinner and all of that stuff? I hope that those barriers are, are gonna kind of begin to, to drop, um, but it's definitely a potential career path for some you know, museum people and I think that it will end up 
helping the institution in the long run because people give to people. They give to institutions, but at the end of the day, they give to people. So they want that relationship, whether it's with the person in advancement, the person in curatorial, the director. But I think that you know it's a, it's a healthy conversation, but it really reminds me of what used to happen years ago about curators and education. I, I think that's a great point. I was certainly mindful that if I made that leap in a development, it opened up a whole different set of doors uh, that would not have been available otherwise, and that has, has proven true. Um, what I'd like to hope, and this may just be wishful thinking, um, but the same energy that infused this organization to encourage curators to, to take a more active role in the leadership of their organizations, that we would do the same thing in development. Uh, and that's, I, I hope that more and more of us are doing that and do see it as a viable um, career direction so that we're shaping institutions for multiple sides, not just the content, but also the, the, the funding and management of the organization. Hi. Oh. Um, I have a question that's kind of the flip side of that, and I'm wondering about other people's experiences. Um, I'm at a small museum, and I am the curator in charge of my program. Um, and I've had a few instances where a donor or trustee has asked me at the very last minute if I could go to dinner or if my husband and I could go to dinner. And for personal reasons, family reasons, babysitting reasons, it just wasn't possible. And then I've, I've said no, and then kind of felt as if there were some repercussions. And I'm wondering how people deal with that personal, professional boundary in a way that is constructive and helpful. That, that's a really great question. I think it's a really hard one, because I, I mean, I, I can speak for myself. Um, I sacrifice my personal life. I mean, I did all the time. The summers in Santa Fe in particular are a nonstop freight train of people visiting and expecting attention. And I, I just give up my personal life for three months. And I, I don't think it's right or fair, <laughs> um, but I don't know another way around it. Yeah, no, I, I certainly agree. But, um, you know, as someone who has a one-year-old, I can't yeah. Oh, no, that. I, I <laughs> you know? Yeah. So, it's you know, I'm wondering what other people's experiences are. Yeah, I, mean, I, can I you would connect hope that some of the audience have some. Can you connect with them, though, on the level of, I, I for instance, my current project was co-curator. And my co-curator has a three-year-old, and she she has a one-year-old, barely a one-year-old. So now the exhibition has opened and we're being asked to do a lot of tours and programs and she has an infant. I mean, it's tough. But I think well, I've seen her very smartly connect with patrons about when their kids were young. I've seen her be like, oh, you know what? Thank you so much for inviting us this weekend. Steve and I would really love it, but you know what? Cora's got some weird bug and the baby's like, I don't know what's going on there. Don't you, your kids must have gotten things like that when they were in school, and I've watched the recognition on their faces, be like, oh gosh, you know, we forgot, because you know, maybe their kids are in college, or their kids are older, and they've forgotten, but that's one possible hook. I'm sure there are other suggestions. Yeah, that can help. <laughs> uh, Allison Green, um, I've had the privilege of working in an institution for a very long time, and started off as a very young curator here 30 years ago. And one of the things I would suggest, particularly to younger curators, is you don't need to know the top patron right away. Just because you know there is the Leonard Lauder of your institution, you don't need to have access to that person. But as a young person, you are hopefully out at openings, at events, that a lot of your senior curators are not at. And all of us can point to people we befriended who seemed to have a fierce interest in art who weren't necessarily ready to be patrons yet, who in time have become incredibly important to us. So forge those friendships. It may be that you're only making a $500 ask you know, at this time that could lead to something much more important down the road. And just to kind of build on that, you, you also don't want your kind of younger, lower level donors to be ne feel neglected, to feel like they're not, because they're not the high level donors, they're not getting any attention from, they should be getting attention as well. Can I just add, so Jen from MFA Boston, I think this advice is invaluable for our colleagues at um, assistant, associate levels, but I also would speak to colleagues who are at senior or chief levels and say, of course, to younger colleagues in the room, absolutely know your craft, listen to Paul, take the initiative. But 
senior colleagues in the room, you should be introducing your younger colleagues to the patrons at these events and in these moments because it's only to your benefit to have more contacts. And if you don't take that opportunity, you're cutting off your nose to spite your face. It's, I think, fundamental to our work to give our younger colleagues that access as well. I would just echo to repeat your, your line. The relationship is with the organization. <laughs> it really is, and that's how you do it, by introducing them to more people. Yeah, moving down the row. Uh, Re <laughs> <laughs> Rita Freed, MFA Boston. Uh, uh, and also... It's not fair, folks. <laughs> You're dominant. But we love to talk. <laughs> uh, speaking of somebody who was an uh, only child, is an only child, uh, terribly introverted, shy, I, formerly shy, <laughs> I think that what I learned from my own background was that when I go to an opening, and I see somebody standing alone, I think that they probably felt like I used to feel when I didn't know anybody in the room. And I, I've made a habit for the last number of years of going up to that person. And I have seldom found people in my own field, but I have found many friends for other departments that way. I, all, all, what I'm really saying is that you're not the only one in the room who might feel left out. Probably a lot of the patrons who are there for the first time are also feeling left out. So just swallow and go up to them. We're going to do a collective hug after this. So. <laughs> um, our development department has encouraged us to approach donors as, as what is your dream and how can we fulfill your dream? And so, <laughs> I'm wondering how this balance can be as well. Well, what about the museum's <laughs> dream? And how is this sort of uh, make that Just balance? Curious. That question. Yeah. I like the fact that your development office is encouraging you as curators to do that as well. Because again, it speaks to that partnership and it also speaks to the fact that you are who the donor wants to see. Um, and also, you're right, we, we do need to continue to think about what's best for the institution and sitting there and having a really good conversation with your donor to ask them what they would like to see. But that's when you also have to bring a development person in to kind of like give the legalities behind whether or not that's a good gift for the institution. I think that development person should be fired. Ah. <laughs> because that person's dream is for you to be a baseball team. So why bring it up? Hi, um, my case study is from three days ago. And um, if maybe, if people are live tweeting, if we could be in the cone of silence right now, because this is very much an active, ongoing situation. Um, I'm opening an exhibition in the fall. Who are you? Uh, my name is Allison Slavey. I'm from Rinalda House Museum of American Art in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. And like you, it's a small museum. I'm the only curator. We have a development team of four, but I'm a curator of one. And I have been developing a relationship with a donor in Winston-Salem that is very important to me. Um, not only is she loaning nine lithographs to the exhibition, but she's supporting it with a big chunk of change. And she came to meet with my director of development on Friday and said, I want a catalog. So I'm not sure what to do with that because it opens in September. It's an emotional relationship. Um, she developed her collection with her husband who died last year. I want to honor them. I'm not sure what to do with this request. I would ask her why she wants that catalog. Is it because she wants something that's tangible that she could show to people? It's yes. something that she wants to honor you know, in the memory of? Yes. And then try to figure out, well, you would love to do that catalog as well because you also want those things. But the situation is you, we don't have the budget for it. Right. What else can we do to honor those two things that they're looking for? And I think it should be a conversation. Right. Um, and it may end up going towards a catalog, but it also may take you elsewhere. But I think you need to find out what, what, what the core driven issues are that she wants this or they want this. 
But when she has that conversation, is that when you take the development person or even the director with you to have that conversation, or is it curator one-on-one? -on -one? Yeah. Yeah. I think you present it as you're being allies with her. You're working side by side, and, and you're not confronting her. Like that's like you know we we don't have the money, we can't do this, you know. Uh, but make it more like you want to solve this problem with her. But here's our situation. I, I like that because it's also a kind of transparency that you know yeah. this is not about manipulating the plans behind anyone's back. It's here's the situation, here's the time we have, the money we have. How can we achieve our mutual aims? In a, in a satisfactory way. And, and hopefully she'll fund the catalog. <laughs> well, but th that's where you do need the director, because if commitments are made, if, if there's a, you know, so what if the donor does come and say, fine, I'll fund the catalog, I want you writing full time for the next four months. Right. That may not be in the institution's best interest. Right. <laughs> and that's where you do need a director to step in and say, right. all right, what's a compromise? Right. Um. Hi, I'm Austin Bailey from the Peabody Essex Museum in Salem. My question has to do a little bit with capital campaigns, and if you could speak a little bit to what may sometimes be competing priorities between gifts of art and gifts of cash, and how you balance that with a donor or sequence, um, if you have any examples. So capital campaign, you need cash. Um, but if there are donors who want to, uh, they're cash poor and they have art that can, they can give, then you, know, you can, from the beginning, being very transparent, saying, if it's not appropriate for your collection, that you will sell it and then put the money into capital campaign. But um, you, you can't accept art as a part of a capital campaign. The MFA tried to. <laughs> um, <clears throat> still kind of silence, right? Uh, so for the MFA's campaign for the, the Art of the Americas wing, um, a fair amount of art was included. And the, the motivation or rationale was that they wanted to build a collection um, worthy of the title Art of the Americas. It was an, an ambitious kind of um, stake in the ground that they were going to present a, a pan-hemispheric approach to the understanding of art, um, North, South, Central America, not just colonial New England. Um, but of course, their collections couldn't quite achieve that. And so there was this notion that while they were raising the money to pay for the building, they should also be building the collection that would go into that building. Uh, so they kind of calculated their campaign goals with the understanding that a certain portion of that would be represented by gifts of art. Gifts of art were actually credited as campaign gifts. Um, so we had to do some, some fancy footwork in the development office to figure out uh, how and when we would record those and, and at what point we would start counting those gifts of art. Um, the end result, of course, was that the, the total campaign goal was dramatically higher um, because it included big gifts of art that did nothing to help us acquire the building. <laughs> uh, so the, the, the on balance, the conclusion was, and this is based pretty much in numbers. I mean, we actually did the, the, the kind of quantified analysis to confirm this. As a result of that increased engagement from gifts of art, as a result of, of bringing those donors closer, um, people that gave art also gave money towards the building. They also endowed galleries and did other things to support the capital campaign. So it, it ended up fueling the capital campaign, but uh, it, it, got, it made for some um, challenging decisions in accounting. Um, I know there are plenty of organizations where you really do have to just kind of say, yeah, the art is not going to count. You've got to keep it out. But that was part of the campaign strategy initially, yeah. was it? It wasn't people were offering you art in lieu of money. Right, right. right. But, but, there, but it also led to plenty of conversations with people who we felt needed to make a cash contribution that, yes, we want your painting, but you're not off the hook. Right. Yeah. right. I think a lot of times, too, um, right before you engage in a capital campaign, there are consultants involved, and they will more than likely be able to, wh what they'll typically do is look at your data pool. They'll look at your database, they'll screen your database and tell you whether or not the, the, the capital campaign, the type of campaign that you want to run is feasible. Um, so I, I think there are ways to kind of like mitigate that before kind of like getting into a situation where it's like, okay, well we don't have we have all of this art, but we don't have the, the monies to kind of like support the space 
so that he, we can keep it. So I, I think it's really important to, to just think about these, these capital, uh, these consultants and how they can be involved with your overall strategy of getting new donors to the table as well. I think just because sometimes there's um, curators are um, being asked to help build the collections and that's, you know, you're concentrating a lot of your primary energies on gifts of art. But if the museum is in the midst of a capital campaign, then you, you know, it's great to hear that you were able to get momentum from the gifts of art to then an ask for actual dollars to then support either that collection or the building or what have you. But I, I think, think it's a sort of a two-step process, it sounds like. Um, and I think more and more of us are probably being asked to solicit funds to support the gift of art along with the object. Like, yes, we'd love, we'd love the thing, but we also need you to give money to care for the thing in perpetuity, <laughs> which is another kind of conversation and much more difficult. Hi, I'm Brian Scholes from the Cincinnati Art Museum. And uh, curatorial staffs and development staffs go through periods of continuity and then also periods of turnover. And I wonder if you have any tips or strategies for maintaining relationships when, for example, you're, you know, st one, of the, one of those two staffs is in a period of transition. Communication. <laughs> I mean, it, it, you know, it, the communication is at the core of everything I think an advancement team does. Um, knowing how and what to say and, and where, when, who to say it to. Uh, but we've, we've gone through some turnover in our development department and someone would leave and a trustee would, or a donor would call and say, but I loved her. Right. Yes, but she's not here anymore. <laughs> and you know, figuring out how to communicate why she's not here anymore um, and then where we're going and, and what our vision is, then you know, we're glad you're still with us and transparency. as a donor. I think also, um, again, I, I spoke earlier about development teams themselves can be very ter uh, territorial. I think uh, that's something that development teams have to deal with internally. Um, a lot of conversations, I think, within the development staffs should really be about collaboration and, and just talking about, you know, what you're doing with your donor. Um, development officers are often assigned um, groups of donors and they become the prospect or the, the donor manager. And I think it's really important for development officers to talk about these conversations that they're having throughout so that when one decides to leave, I mean, you can continue the relationship with just based on the conversations. And I guess, again, that does speak to communication. Brian, you just have to create sort of a lesson plan for the incoming new development person because the average amount of time that a development person stays at their job is two years. Hi, I'm Jerry Smith with the Museum of Fine Arts, St. Petersburg, Florida. And two points. One, very quickly, on the scenario of someone telling you up front, this is going to be difficult. I liked your predecessor. I think they were run out on a rail on unkindly or whatever, I believe that, or whatever the case may be, however a response, negative response to an immediate hello is, I think the internal reaction to that should be yippee because they've let you know what their defense is. It's as if it's a sports team letting you know how they're setting up their defense. And so then you just need to manage how to work with that. I've actually come to Part of my coming to build a relationship with that individual is that I really appreciate that she's honest about everything in life. Like, if I'm with her at an art fair and she sees something she doesn't like, she's like, that sucks. Like, and I've come to realize that I can ask her something and she won't mince words, and she doesn't lie to me, ever. She just sort of says what she means. So now, now that the relationship does exist, I realize in a way that's one of the strengths of knowing her is that I can trust her, essentially, to tell me what she really thinks. It's not always fun to hear someone say they don't like an exhibition or they didn't have a good time on a patron trip or something, but a lot of people just smile and go along with it, and then you start to hear the murmuring mm -hmm. of a group of donors' discontent. And you know, it's actually a strength of this individual and the fact that she was willing to tell me what other people were probably thinking. And it'll bring the two of you closer, because yeah. she can trust you. And, and I, it made me feel like I had to rise to the challenge. Like, yeah. And, and one uh, last thing, not that this has ever happened to me, but <laughs> what happens when you are working with a donor and you just 
don't personally like that individual. They're just it's a great really question. unhappy, miserable, whatever the case may be, and, and the, that personal connection just isn't there. How do you work with that? I mean, these are basically blind dates. Like, we're getting set up with people who perhaps the only connection is that they like European painting or they like contemporary art. And you're right. What if you just had bad chemistry? I, I, I think that um, as a development officer, if, if you do come into that sort of situation, I know myself, I'll draw a line. And I will say, you know, out, out front, if this, if, if this isn't a relationship that you don't want to continue, I'm happy to find someone who's on staff who you might feel a little bit more you know, inclined to, to deal with. I mean, it really, at the end of the day, again, how do they want to engage your institution? It's not about me, it really. It's more about the donor and how they want to continue, if they do. Um, and, and surprisingly enough, when I'm open and upfront and transparent about that, because even I, I don't want to deal with somebody who doesn't want to deal with me, it just wouldn't work. Um, most of the time, it works out to where I, I have continued the relationship. And again, everybody's up front. Everybody knows where you stand. I think it's really important just to be honest. And if you know that you can't deal with that relationship, pass it on. Pass it along. If you're in, if you're in a place large enough where you can pass it along, I think that's, that's the advantage of you know introduce other people, find a fit, find someone that can connect with that person. But a lot of us are not in a place where we can say, oh, one of my other six curators can manage this relationship. Um, bring the director in. Bring, bring the director and bring someone else. But I think, I mean, I have to say at some point, I mean, I think they're just relations where you just kind of have to go, all right, it's an hour lunch. I'm going to smile and enjoy it. And then after I leave, I can say everything I want about a horrible person they are. But for that hour, they're fine. I, I just I think mean, of the end result, what that relationship is going to bring. And, you know, it's been put upon you to deliver. And I always think of it as a game, you know, and I was like, you know, I'll walk away and I'll say, I didn't think that person could be any worse, but they are. <laughs> <laughs> now it's going to really cost them. <laughs> Hi, I have a um, more general question. We're, we're assuming, you know, obviously the director and the development staff, and we're assuming the curatorial staff is getting very involved in, de in development, which I agree is really, really important. Um, what about situations where directors really feel that the patrons are, they want to they wanna see them. They, they don't necessarily think that the patrons want to talk to the curators. I, I would put a dollar amount on that. I, I don't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't just offer your director up to someone who's not really giving. I, I feel like you have to pay to play. No, my but question, your question is, is when the director is doesn't the opposite, want to share. Right. Oh, okay. <laughs> right. When the director is proprietary about relationships and doesn't open up. Or doesn't necessarily, you know, see it the way that we're assuming, you know, what we're all assuming, I think, is that, you know, patrons really often do want to talk to the person who's, you know, who's curated the exhibition or who's the expert in a certain area of. My reaction would be to try to understand why. Um, and I, I'm just, I'm trying to think through kind of comparable situations where um, in some cases it was not so much about, I don't trust you in this relationship as it was, this is a relationship that I'm anxious about. And I, I feel a need to control <laughs> every aspect of it. Uh, so, in so, so in a way, it's I don't trust you. It's I don't trust anyone else to take responsibility for this. Um, that may or may not o create an opening, but it might offer some understanding, at least in terms of why. Yeah, I why mean, are they I'm not speaking in a general way, not specifically. Mm -hmm. I think I guess I'm just speaking to you know this assumption that we are operating under. Yeah. But I think some directors do think you know I'm the person who who this is my job. I, I, not naming names, but I can think of an organization um, <laughs> where the, the trustees, as kind of the premier donors, um, were managed almost exclusively by the director and the director of development. Um, their meetings were often not even held on site, and the staff had no, almost no interaction. Um, whereas many other places, the MFA included, trustees and staff were in conversation constantly, all the time. And that seems 
much healthier. But there, there are places where there's just this barrier. And I, I, mean, I don't know. Does anyone else have a What's better? What's the AAMD answer for that? <laughs> <laughs> I think most directors don't have the time to meet with every donor. You know, and I, I'm, it's much better to divide and conquer. And I think the directors also have to be re really respectful of the curator's time. And, and, and many times it's their job to protect the curator and only bring them out when it's absolutely necessary to shine and to close the deal. Uh, but the situation that you're talking about, I don't think it's a healthy situation. Yeah, I mean, I, can't, I think it probably is, it does happen, uh, and I, it's not healthy. I mean, it just seems unsustainable to me. I mean, what does the president of the board feel about that? Because they're working side by side as well, right? Hi, I'm Sarah Hall from the Frick in Pittsburgh, and I don't know if anyone can answer this, and maybe more commiserating than anything, but um, I, my question is related to what happens after the gift, and you're continuing this relationship, and, and the circumstance that I have in mind in particular, it's second generation. So it's a gift given by the family, and the next generation really feels still very proprietary and wants to have annual meetings and dictate you know, interpretation of the collection, and you're not using this as much as I'd like you to, and um, you know, can I borrow this back for the Christmas party? Um, you know, really, really inappropriate kinds of, of requests and, you know, not really giving up ownership even though it hasn't been part of the family for 20 years and it was their parents and not their. How old are they and how healthy are they? <laughs> uh, younger than I am, I think. Okay, yeah. You're, you're going to need to find another strategy than wait them out. <laughs> I, I, we've had situations like this. We, we had situations like this at the MFA. Um, in some cases, it was, it was not even individuals. Um, there's a, a whole complicated history of the church silver. Um, a lot of the, the rare important pieces of silver in various New England churches are kept on deposit at the MFA for security, but the church wants them back once or twice a year for different services, creating a nightmare for insurance and registrars and curators and everyone else involved. Um, in, and there were private donors who had similar things, similar agreements that, that you know, mom promised that we could keep using this anytime we wanted, um, in which case we, we really had to construct some difficult but direct confrontational <laughs> conversations. We understand this. This is, again, transparency. This is the difficulty this puts us in. It's really not appropriate. It's really not professional. We're not caring for the objects in the way that we're charged. Um, we may or may not be violating IRS guidelines. Uh, it, it, it just kind of laying out is there another way to do this? You're putting us we in a very difficult. We always mention the IRS. I'm writing that down. <laughs> <laughs> the IRS is a very helpful boogeyman. <laughs> I, I just want to. No one really knows what the IRS wants. <laughs> they just know they're out to get us. I just want to say, luckily, our founder died with no heirs, and just this. this <laughs> Despite five husbands, she died unmarried, too. And I, I will say, since you mentioned that, these are not Frick heirs. I'll, I'll say that um, clearly, just because that's such a well-known name. But it is about honoring the original donors and their vision. And as their heirs, they want the situ situation to improve and to grow. And so they now need to step up and to support this project or their vision so that it can be bigger than it was, right? So. It's their duty, in a way, to, so, so to contribute to this so it can be uh, a be, uh, better seen by visitors and the community and not just used for their personal use. And I, you know, I think they, they, they just have to get it through their head that they're not helping the situation. And if, if they continue to dwindle uh, the situation, then you may not be able to honor the original vision, and that's, that would be a terrible thing. Is there any recourse at all to go back to a written agreement with a donor generations ago and change it today legally? I think there's, there's cautionary tales. We, we all hear these things, but at the same time, we all might find ourselves in a negotiation and go, yeah, sure, I'll commit to that. My predecessors will have to deal with it. <laughs> I think we're, we're, as a field, we're smarter now about making these commitments that are unsustainable, yeah, whether that's naming rights for a gallery in perpetuity. I mean, in perpetuity is the worst phrase we've ever come up with as a field. Like, why would you commit anything in perpetuity? We're worried about keeping the lights on next month. We really think we're going to be able to guarantee a thousand years from now 
Uh, it's just it's ridic a ridiculous concept. So many, many, and more and more organizations are moving to, you know, lifetime naming rights or naming rights to this space for a period of 30 years and then right of first refusal. Very specific kind of um, me measured ways of defining these these acknowledgments for gifts. Um, but you can go back, and I, I know of other institutions uh, where they decided, you know, that premier space, there's no one left representing that family, um, or that there are heirs and they're comfortable, we'll, we'll negotiate with them and agree that we'll remove their names or move their names somewhere else and sell that space again for a 15 year period, not in perpetuity. You can go back, just ask Mr. Barnes. <laughs> <laughs> Again, it's, but it's all in how you do it, too. There are clumsy ways and there are elegant ways. Hi there. Um, my name is Courtney McNeil. I'm from the Telfair Museums in Savannah, Georgia. Um, before my question, I wanted to jump way back to Alex's comment a few minutes ago about managing your personal life along with development demands and, and donor events. For me, it's been really helpful to sort of establish parameters with our development department and really enlist them as my allies. They know for me personally, you know, I can do up to two evening events a week. I need to know a week in advance. And they help me in scheduling and serving as the buffer. Um, and it really prevents having me in the awkward position of, of having to say no. And I know that's not always possible, but it's worked, it's worked pretty well for me. Um, my question is about um, this idea of balance between uh, curatorial departments and the needs of the development department. Um, I have a great relationship with our development department, and um, but I always feel like they have this this worry in the back of their heads that the curators are going to go rogue and ask for things that might be in competition with, say, the capital campaign, the endowment. We right now have an endowment campaign going on, and we're really heavily dependent on annual giving from our donors. Um, and I genuinely don't I don't want to go rogue. I want to be supportive of the the institution's goals overall. But there are some donors who uh, who would give me five thousand dollars towards an acquisition, who would not give five thousand dollars towards annual giving or an endowment campaign. So, and I want to work with the development department to sort of figure out who those people are and what the right approaches are. Um, so I was wondering if you all had any tips on communication between, as far as setting strategy between development officers and, and curators. It sounds like you're doing it already. I yeah. mean, you're doing the right thing. Talk as a team, what are our priorities, and what do we expect from this individual? What's realistic? We don't want to cannibalize one project, but if we know they're not going to be motivated to make a half a million dollar gift to the endowment, but they will make a $5,000 gift for an acquisition, let's not waste our time. Go get the $5,000. Right. But, but it's the communication again, and I think you're already, you're already there in terms of knowing that that's an issue and should be discussed. Yep. I think that's our last question for today. I want to thank our panelists, but also all of you for being such a participatory audience. I hope you take these conversations home to your museum.